morning, church. It's good to be together. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, I am Jim. I love Jesus. I want to welcome you to our family today. If you're with us virtually, we're grateful you're in our midst as well. Our call to worship comes from the psalmist. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Sisters and brothers, let us worship our God. this morning and I want us to just pause in this moment and I want us to think of a time where we felt hopelessness but the faithfulness of God and the character of God came through for us I know it's really easy for us to come in Sunday to Sunday we all carry so many different things but for us to just pause in this moment as we reflect on this precious hymn that I'm sure most of us have sang most of our lives and re be reminded of God's faithfulness. I know this week I got some news that really took me back. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is that gonna be the outcome? This circumstance is heavy. But weeks ago, I planned to sing this song and I feel like it's a testimony even just standing here. And we, when we open our mouths and we declare the faithfulness of Jesus, it ministers to us. And we are strengthened by that. So as we sing this last verse, I want us just to reflect that God is faithful no matter what you're going through, no matter what's up ahead. Faithful is the name of our Lord and he is good. 
sing with me, pardon for sin. Pardon for sin, the peace that endureth, thy only presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. thankful for the faithfulness of Jesus. Sisters and brothers, you may be seated. And as we are gathered in worship today, I invite you to find the connection card in your bulletin to fill it out and let us know that you're worshiping with us. On the back of that card, there's an opportunity for you to respond uh, by sharing your prayers and a few other uh, things there for you. If you check confidential, only our pastoral team will see that. Otherwise, our elders, our deacons, and prayer teams will pray with and for you today and throughout this week. For those of you worshiping online, we're so glad that you're with us as well. You have a connection card just above the live feed if you click that link and you can share your prayers with us also. A couple uh, important announcements, many great things happening in the life of the church as we are in full swing in our fall season. Uh, coming up this week, in fact, on Wednesday evening is our annual trunk or treat here in the parking lot at FPC. We need your trunk. We also need you to come and enjoy, um, but we need you to decorate your trunk and pass out candy. There's a sign up online or you can see Hunter as well. I think we have 20 trunks at the moment. We, we'd like more. And the good news for you is all you have to do is decorate. We will give you the candy to pass out. So um, sign up and be here. That's Wednesday uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. this week. Another great opportunity coming up in the near future, FPC 101 will be on November 5th from 3 to 7 p.m. And because we hit our Advent schedule in December, this will be the last FPC 101 for the year. So if you've been holding off on going, make sure you sign up. That's November 5th, 3 to 7 p.m. Dinner and child care are provided. It's a great opportunity for you to learn all about the church and to get connected in discipleship and community groups and service here at FPC. So uh, sign up online, you can write on your connection card, FPC 101, tell me more and I will reach out to you or you can go online, fpcnorfolk.org and sign up there. Um, one final but even perhaps the most important announcement, I'm gonna ask the Bullock family to come and join me uh, here at the front. It is Name Tag Sunday. And as you know, if you've been around, uh, each Name Tag Sunday, we have the great privilege of welcoming new official members. And Kevin and Amy have been around for a little while, um, but we recently learned that they will not be moving away, uh, which I think we're more grateful for that than their membership. So we're, we're so glad that they're here. Um, and since they're not moving, they are now official members of FPC, and we have a gift for both of you. Uh, so when you join the church, we give you our towel of servanthood, and it's a reminder that the Lord has called you here to live out your calling as the hands and feet of Christ. And on it are printed these words of our Savior. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet, as I have set you an example, that you should do as I have done for you. So we hope that you'll display that somewhere prominently in your home, which again is in the Norfolk area, not in <laughs> Pennsylvania. Um, 
That's right, you're not going anywhere. Um, so we're so glad that you're here, so glad that you're official members of the church and that the Lord will continue to use us in our midst. And all of you, Madison and Mackenzie is in the nursery and the future Bullock on the way. So awesome, welcome. With that, I invite you to stand and to greet one another. and I work with our kids at the preschool and at the church and we are so glad that you're here. And for those of you that are visiting or if this is your first time here, the kids come up, we talk for a few minutes in chil at the children's sermon and then we go upstairs to room 205, 206 to children's church and we have a great time that's specific to the kids with our um, scriptures for the day and then we come back at the end of the sermon in time for Sunday school community hour. So we're so glad you're here. And before I get started, because I always forget, hey Weston, listen, everybody look at me. This Wednesday, you are supposed to invite your friends and your neighbors to the church parking lot starting at six o'clock. We are having our annual trunk or treat and it's gonna be so much fun. Raise your hand if you already have your Halloween costume. All right, so who's coming? I have my Halloween costume and I am so excited. Um, and so we are gonna have our trunk or treat and this year we have a petting zoo and we have hundreds of hot dogs and we have people that are hosting trunks that will be passing out candy and we will be having the best time ever and you know I love those giant yard blow ups and I have 20 of them this year and 20. So I am so excited for you to come and invite your friends and neighbors um, to our church function. For those of you that are sitting out in the audience, I do still need some folks to hoax trunks. So please either tell me um, if you're able to do it or go on our events page of our website and sign up so that we can have all of our kids have a great time. All right. So in children's church um, and in regular church, we um, say the Lord's Prayer. Hey, Callum, it's Callum's birthday today, and he is six years old. Callum, can you control your brother? Um, <laughs> Jim, can you control his brother? <laughs> so, all right, so listen. Um, so in children's church and at church, we say the Lord's Prayer, and we try to memorize that as part of what we do in the children's ministry. If you know the Lord's Prayer, um, tell me, raise your hand. All right, okay, so listen to this part of the Lord's Prayer and I want somebody to think really hard and tell me what you think it means. All right, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What do you think that means? All right, I'm gonna, can I call on you? All right, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What do you think that means, Keith? Forgive us those as Jesus tells us us to do all. Excellent, wonderful, what a good job. So to forgive others. So listen, have you ever, Keith, had somebody do something that hurt your feelings, something that was not nice to you? Yes. And how does that feel? Not good, right? Not but good. does it feel better when they apologize? Yes. All right, let me ask you this, Riley. Ha so have you ever done something that hurt somebody else's feelings? Never, ever? 
Listen, I do all the time, and I've got a lot of people that like to tell me about it. Listen, um, so it is really good to apologize, right, and to ask for forgiveness. Um, and who else always gives us forgiveness? You said it. Who is the best one? Callum, it's your birthday. Come answer. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus forgives us all the time, right? Every single time. We can't make, we can't make too many mistakes for Jesus to forgive us. All right, so I'm going to take this. Look. All right, I've got a pencil. And since it's Callum's birthday, all right, Callum, I'm going to write your name in pencil. All right. It's a mechanical pencil. It was all I could find. All right, so there's Callum's name. It's his birthday. So if we make a mistake, if Callum makes a mistake and he asks for forgiveness and his, he, he says something unkind to Weston and he asks for forgiveness and Weston forgives him, the mistake goes away. But look, you can kind of still see it, right? You can still see it, and that's what it's like when people make mistakes. You, people hurt your feelings, and you, you, they ask for forgiveness, but sometimes those hurt words still stay there. But when you make a mistake and ask God for forgiveness, what happens? Let me write Callum's name again. Callum, are you watching? It's your birthday. It's a really big day. And you ask God for forgiveness it totally goes away, right? And you can't see any of the mistakes that you've made because God forgives us over and over and over again. So we're going to go to Children's Church and we're going to talk about um, what it means to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and talk about forgiveness and the incredibly um, wonderful forgiving love that God has for us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for the privilege that we have to come here and to celebrate birthdays and to be a church family, Lord. And we are so thankful that you have given us love and you continue to forgive us over and over again, Lord. And we pray that every day that we become more like you and we learn how to forgive others, Lord, so that we can have a blank slate, Lord, and start over. In your heavenly name, amen. Oh, uh, good stuff, good stuff. Okay, get your Bibles. We're going to look at two passages this morning in the New Testament. And uh, let's start with Matthew chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, find Matthew chapter 6. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is uh, doing five through six. Uh, Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. So these are all the words of Jesus. If you're using a Bible out here and you're here with us, it's on page 970 in the paging of our Bibles. And you'll notice as you look at it that right above this passage, so we're picking up at the 14th verse in chapter 6, right above this is where Jesus gives the, his, his disciples and those who are following him uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, a, latter later, uh, a latter letter that uh, Paul wrote to uh, the church in Ephesus. Um, you're going to find it on page 1176 if you picked up a Bible out, uh, out there or... Um, if you're with us online, go ahead and find it. Ephesians 4, picking up at verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for all, we are all members of one body. In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, and don't give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been st stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Don't let any unwholesomeness talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up accordingly to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. 
Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It's the word of the Lord. Okay, talking about forgiveness today. Um, we're gonna get out here early because uh, I know nobody struggles with that. And um, so we're, we just kind of, it's just not an issue for us. We gave our life to Jesus and everything's been good and um, we don't have to struggle with that anymore. So give me, uh, instead of like preaching, let me tell you a little story then. Um, two young fish <clears throat> swimming along. From the other direction comes an older fish. The older fish gets to them and he looks at the two young fish and he says, morning boys, how's the water? Two young fish swim off for a while. One turns to the other and says, what in the world is water? Okay, now, if you, are, uh, if you have erudition in uh, commencement addresses, you'll realize that that was uh, an opening line or story from a commencement address to Kenyon College in 2005. It's actually one of my favorite speeches ever. I listen to it over and over and over. It's not a faith-based speech, but I just listen to it over and over the way David Foster Waller, Wallace put it together. And he says that as he tells that story that we have these didactic little parable-ish stories right, these didactic little parable-ish stories, because the most important realities are often the most difficult to talk about. And so we tell these kinds of, these little stories and try to get something across because really those important realities are, are the most difficult to talk about. Now, in the context of today, let me kind of build it out in a way that I, that I hope will be helpful for us. And let me start with another sort of a little story, but an illustration for your life. The truth is, every single person here is writing a novel. Whether you know it or whether you claim it or not, we are all writing our own novel. Every single day, we take pen to paper in some form or another, and we write our story. And when we write our own novels, there's some, there some components of a really good novel, right? Or hey, Louis Borges does a great uh, a great telling of how to, how, what, a, what a great novel is. So, so here's one thing that's, that's important to a great novel, is it has a central character, a hero in some way. And in your novel, you are the central character. You can't help but be the central character. Everything is about you. Every experience you have, there's nothing that you've ever experienced where you weren't at the center of it. Even as an observer, it's how you understood it. So like, that's just, that's kind of existential, but it's really just reality, right? I mean, just we are the central character in our novel. So you are the central character in your novel. <clears throat> but almost all great novels have other characters that are in it, supporting actors. And that's the people that are around you, those people that that you interact with every day, you know, if you're married, if you, if you have children, if, you're, if you have parents, if you have friends, families, whatever it is, all these other people are these supporting characters. And the thing that's really interesting about this is that in your novel, so just bear with me, I think this is really, really gonna be helpful for us. In your novel, you have a default setting because not only as Borges would say, what a great novel is is not just to have a central character, but there has to be a struggle right? Every good story has a struggle in it. And the struggle is about the main character. It's what the main character is going through. And the other characters that are in there support that struggle or they are part of the struggle. But you've got this own, your own struggle. And that's, that's a wound in a sense. You've got this thing that you want to make work out. There's this thing that you're supposed to do. And it's, and it's true. Take a Harlequin romance and there's still a struggle in it. Will she or won't she? You know, will he or won't he? You know, what, all of those things, there's this, there's, this, there's this struggle that's in it, right? So life is, life is this way. What we do in that struggle is absolutely critical to defining and speaking about the central role. So if you're writing the novel and you are the central character and you're forming it, then everything is about you. 
and everybody else supports you. Now start to think about that, what that means. It means that we live this very self-centered life. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just who we are as human beings. It's, it's, it's about us. When a baby is first born, a baby starts to cry, the baby wants something. <clears throat> the baby is the center for them, is the center of that universe. And we live into this. And when we get into disagreements, when we get into these struggles, here's the thing we almost always do. We become the ones that are right and everyone else is wrong. We become the ones that, well, let's think about it in the sense of forgiveness. We become the ones who really don't need forgiveness because we know why we did what we did. Does that make sense? Like, you know, I know I messed up, I'm sorry, but let me tell you why I did what I did. We do this all the time in arguments, right? You have an argument with somebody that you're really close to and you start to say, yeah, I'm sorry, but you don't understand what was really going on in my mind. Because we know why, we're okay. But we don't care about somebody else's why. We just know that they hurt us. And when somebody comes to us and says, yeah, well, you know, I'm sorry I hurt you, but let me tell you why I hurt you. It's like, I don't need to hear that. You just need to say, you hurt me. And so we start to live into this life where, where this sense of forgiveness is like, yeah, I don't, you know, I get it. I, I sort of get it, but I don't really need it because I know why I did what I did. It's the other people that really need this forgiveness. We deserve it because we understand why. Others have to earn it. And so when we start to think about forgiving someone, it's almost always comes down to this. That person needs to earn my forgiveness. They need to pay something back. They need to say that they're sorry. They need to correct something. And if they can't correct it, if they can't pay it back, then I'm called to exact revenge upon them because that's the way the story was written. And if you reflect on that today, we live in a world that's filled with revenge. It's just, it, it permeates almost everything. It permeates our stories, it permeates what we see on television, you know, in, in movies, it, it permeates the way we kind of think. It's a sense of, of revenge because if, you, if somebody has to earn that forgiveness and they have to pay something back, but they don't have enough to pay it back that hurts too much for me, then, then there has to be this, this revenge. And so even in our closest relationships, someone will say, I need your forgiveness, and, and we'll say, okay, well, I'll forgive you, but let me tell you how much you hurt me. And we have this need to go over that. It's, it's, there's, this, there's this punishment that kind of comes with that. So as we start to look at this drama of our life, this novel of our life, and we realize that we've got this, this, so we've got a central character, we've got a struggle, and we've got this side of need to kind of resolve it. Forgiveness defines who God is in the story. How we see forgiveness defines who God is in the story. So here's some ways, right? So the first is, I don't really need forgiveness. I know why I did it, I don't wanna do it, I'm not gonna do it again, whatever, I don't really need it. And when I don't feel like I really need forgiveness, it's others that need me to forgive them more than I need forgiveness. When I start to see it that way, then I don't need God. And I become God in my story. And I say things like, vengeance is mine. Now this plays out in a variety of ways. It's not just in, <clears throat> in the role of it's like just forgiveness. Um, I had somebody that came to meet with me some years back, and um, he was letting me know, nice guy, was letting me know that they were, he was, had been visiting and he was gonna go visit, find another place, another church. And one of the things that came up in the conversation was, um, he said, you know, what, one of the things that troubles me is that you pray for peace all the time. I mean, like even on like Christmas Eve, you pray for peace. And that really troubles me because you need to support our military. And, um, and this praying for peace, I mean, and we tried to talk about that and I said, you know what, well, first off, let me tell you, I've, I've, never, I've never met a person in the military that didn't ask me to pray for peace. <laughs> if anyone wants us to pray for peace. But, but tell me more why. He says, well, you don't really think peace is gonna happen, do you? There needs to be justice. 
There needs to be this justice, and, and, and once this justice is, is, is meted out, then we can talk about peace, but there has to be this, this justice. And whenever we start to think about and talk about justice, like we are the ones that mete out justice, we put ourselves, without really recognizing it, in these very, very dangerous places where we start to really think that, that we are God. We know what God wants. We are the ones who are and this justice becomes transactional. It becomes about, you did this, you pay this. You did this, you pay this. And then we start to realize that our relationship with God becomes very transactional. I, I sinned, I need to be forgiven. I get something back, I get this. And when we start to live in those ways, it's not only, I think, I don't think it's only troubling, it's very sad. Because everything is about, is the, are the scales level? Are we balanced out? Is everything okay? Are we okay in all of our relationships and all this kind of stuff? And so in those ways, we either don't need God or we just need a transactional God. But there's a third way to look at it, to know that I need forgiveness and I can't earn it. To know that I need forgiveness and I can't earn it. There's nothing I can do that can make myself good enough to be worthy of that forgiveness, but I know I need it. We in our tradition call it total depravity and we think it's our most joyous theological doctrine. Because when I know I need it and I know I can't earn it, nothing will suffice short of a loving God. And when I realize that I, that I have this loving God, that I need this loving God, then the novel changes, the narrative changes, and now I'm no longer the central character, but God is. And that's the biggest shift that starts to happen in our lives, right? It's not as if I need God for me, but I know simply that I wanna live under this God because I can't do it. There's no way I can make it right. I can't explain the whys enough to people. I can't, I can't I can't make it right enough for anyone. I can't make it right enough for me before my God. It's only God that can do it. So when Jesus says this in, in Matthew chapter six, he says, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. We look at this and we think that Jesus is talking about something transactional. I don't think he is. I don't think Jesus is saying, you do this, so you get this, you do this, so you get this, or you don't do this, so you don't, you know. I don't think he's saying that. I think Jesus is instead saying this. You need to recognize, as Jesus is speaking to his people, you need to recognize you need God. That, that there's, there's no way you're gonna get it right. And he's not gonna come and set it right for you and you're gonna keep it right. There's just no way. You don't need to think vengeance is mine because the Bible verse really says vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You don't need to live a life of revenge. Instead, you can love as God loves. There's a sense of being free, that this, this sense of forgiveness is, is not simply about you know, trying to make sure that I'm right with other people or I'm right with God, but the sense of forgiveness is it lets me live a free life. It, it lets me live into freedom because now God's in charge. And all this forgiveness that I, that I know I receive from him, then I meet it out to others because, because it's all from him. And the beautiful part about this is that forgiveness, other than Jesus dying on the cross for us, Forgiveness in our lives is not a one and done. It, it doesn't, if, if somebody starts saying, you know, yeah, I had this person really, and, um, and I just decided one day I was gonna forgive them, and then it was all done. I'm not sure that works too well. I think it's more a process. I think it's more a, a living into it. I think, it's, I think it's more, I think there's something else to it. That's what, that's what Paul is saying when he's writing to the church in Ephesus. In your anger, don't sin. 
Don't give the devil a foothold. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, and brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example. Walk in the way of love. He's not trying to beat us up in this. He's simply saying that, no, you don't, you don't have to. You can be free. And the freedom comes daily. The forgiving comes daily. The, the, the ability to be able to forgive is, is something that, that just happens as we, as we move forward in our relationship with our God, not in our relationship with that person or with that thing that was done, but it's in our relationship with our God that we, that we start to get this, this great freedom and we're not held bondage, we're not held hostage by the forgiving, we're not held hostage by the wound, we're, we're not controlled by that. I mean, every one of us knows what it's like to go back to something and just some strange thing, and just go back to it and feel like you're living it again, you're reliving it, and it's like this painful stuff that was done to us or, or the things that we did. And what Jesus wants to say is, is you, don't, you don't have to do that anymore. I absorbed it all at one time on the cross. I, I died for this, all pain, all suffering, all sin, I absorbed. And so now you can, you can have this freedom, and you can claim it every day, and you see, this, this, this freedom keeps us attuned to the voice of God in all things. It's about our relationship with Him. That's what this forgiveness is about. And this great joy of life is that we don't have to be in charge at all. I, I can put the pen down from the novel and I can live it. And, and the greatest joys that we have the greatest joy-filled memories that you have in your life, I will almost guarantee, are when you were a child. Now think about that for a moment. My dad um, <clears throat> died, uh, had dementia when he died. And I can remember so many times going and seeing my dad, um, visiting my mom and dad in their home, and, and my dad would have no idea who I was. But when he was still verbal, I could get him to sit down and talk and tell me the most amazing details of something that happened to him when he was six years old. I think it's one of the, one of the blessings that so often comes in dementia in the midst of its pain, is that if we want to remember something, let's remember that time when we lived under the loving wings of someone who took care of our life. I think the greatest joy-filled memories that we have, I know certainly for me, are memories when I knew everything was gonna be okay because my mom came in the room. When I knew that my dad was gonna be there and could help me process the last breakup or the last, those, those memories in our lives when we, when, when we knew we were just under someone else's protection. And the thing that's so powerful about it is that the best, most beautiful part of childhood is the freedom that we had. We had the freedom to think and to dream and to do and to do all of these things because we had this umbrella of safety. I hope you had it. If you didn't have it, it's something that, 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 that you really need to try to consider. What is it now that I have that's this umbrella of safety? But for most of us, it's this, it's this place that I, that I knew I was okay. That's what Jesus is saying. He, even in the context of forgiveness, he's saying, I want you to live in this freedom. I want you to have the freedom to live. I don't want you to, to feel like everything is a transaction. I don't want you to feel like you have to pay it back to God in order to be right. I don't want you to feel like you have to pay it back to another or another has to pay it back to you for you to be right. I want you to live in a different kind of freedom, a freedom, a freedom to live that is so real and essential, so hidden in plain sight all around us all the time that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over, this is water. This is, this is what gives my life meaning. Because I don't have to keep fighting it. I don't have to keep making it. I don't have to keep trying. I don't have to keep all this stuff. 
I simply live under those wings of grace. The water that flows so beautifully. And the key to it all is how I forgive and how I'm forgiven and how I seek to decide I no longer want to be controlled by this thing. I no longer want to be controlled by the things that were done to me. And even more, I don't want to be controlled by the things that I did. And Jesus says, you don't have to. I've absorbed all of that for you. And all I want for you right now is to be a child of God and to live into the freedom under my protection, under my forgiveness, under my grace. So I don't know where in your life you're being held hostage right now. I don't know if it's over something that you need, you think you need to make right and you don't know how to do it or, or, or something that you feel like someone's done to you and you haven't been able to move on from that. Either way, you know you're being held hostage. Jesus says you don't have to. No longer. This is water. This is what is around us all the time, this loving grace of our Father. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you and I praise you for this day. The truth, Lord Jesus, is we know that the most important realities are often the most difficult to talk about. And so we stuff it down. Even in our own stories that we write, we just stuff it down. But you simply say to us that we no longer need to. You're not making a deal with us, a bargain. You're simply giving us life. And you're saying, claim it today. Claim it tomorrow. And the day after tomorrow and the day after. Live in freedom and have the freedom to live. We hear you. Give us your spirit so that we can do it. We pray this in the beautiful holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, we have beautiful opportunities to respond and worship to God's word and his faithfulness. And we do that in a number of ways with our tithes, with our offerings, with our prayers, and the ways in which we commit our lives. So in a moment, our ushers will come forward, and as they do, I invite you to place your offering in the basket along with your connection card. And remember on the back, uh, you can offer prayers and check opportunities to respond. And for those of you worshiping online, there's an opportunity for you as well, just above the live feed. If you click give, you can participate in the offering in that way. You can also text to give by texting the number 530-5683. So as we collect our offerings, as we collect our prayers, we turn to a time of prayer. And I'm reminded this morning that as we are called to release our bitterness, our rage, our anger, our brawling, our slander, our malice, that prayer offers an, an opportunity to, to lay those things before the throne. And as we've freed ourselves from those burdens to take up prayers and to hold on our hearts and hold together prayers for our, our church, our world, our nation, and so this morning as we do, we lift up prayers for Israel, and for Gaza, and for the hostages, and for those who are separated from loved ones, for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We continue to lift up prayers for Ukraine. As a church who has a large military presence, we continue to lift up prayers for our military, their families, both here in our church family, but also in our nation, and prayers for peace in their midst. We lift up prayers for our city, for our soup kitchen and the volunteers who host more than 50 guests each Saturday, week in and week out without fail. We lift up prayers for the homeless and working poor in our city. And we offer a prayer of praise this morning as well for our, uh, an opportunity that our FPC staff had on Tuesday to go to the Global Friendship House at ODU and to serve over 70 international students lunch and to, to eat lunch with them and be in community. 
And we are thankful for opportunities that we continue to have here locally, but to share the gospel globally. And there's an opportunity, if you are interested, to host international students this weekend on either Friday or Saturday night in your home for dinner. If you'd like more information uh, and you want to hear more about that, you can find me after worship or you can send me an email, just joel at fpcnorfolk.org. We lift up our church and the opportunity to learn in, through welcoming prayer this week. We lift up prayers for our trunk or treat this Wednesday evening and the great opportunity to build community. We continue to lift up prayers for those who are mourning loss. And we lift up prayers for the family of Todd Yapple, who died on October 13th. We lift up those um, struggling with brokenness in mind, body, and spirit. We continue to pray for Chris McKinnon Hing and Richard Bray and the 109 prayer requests that we received last week. Sisters and brothers, let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your forgiveness. We are reminded this morning that as your forgiveness is complete and perfect for us, that we are called to be a people who offer forgiveness to one another. So Father, this morning I ask that you give us wisdom and discernment and strength and courage to let go of our bitterness, to lay aside our rage, our anger, the places where we think we are right, or those places where we know we were wrong, but we want to explain why. We ask for the wisdom to, to let those things go, to lay them at your feet, to be liberated and freed from them, to lay aside all malice, all the brawling and slander that we harbor within us, to let those things go and to instead be filled with your hope with your forgiveness, with your love, compassion, with your grace, and to seek to be a people that share that hope and grace and forgiveness with one another and with the world. Father, we ask that you use us in mighty ways to build your kingdom here, to shine your light. And as we prepare to go out, I'm reminded that we go out as your body, as your people, that we go with you and with one another. And so we lift our voices together in prayer, praying in the way that you taught us as we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship our Lord.
and amen. Uh, I want to encourage you, Valina did a beautiful job on this particular, all great, but this particular insert on forgiveness. Take this and uh, let it be a a vehicle for you um, as you move forward in your life and your relationship with God. If you're worshiping with us for the first time, we've got a gift for you. It's a little book by Rick Warren called What on Earth Am I Here For? It's free. You don't have to sign anything or shake a hand. Just when you go out the doors, look between the doors, and you'll see a big table there. Take a book. Uh, If you're with us virtually and you want that, just uh, let us know on that connection card, and we'll make sure that we get one to you. If you want to hold up anything in prayer, our prayer team's been praying for us throughout this service. They'll be up front at the end of the service. Come on up and give them the gift and uh, uh, get the opportunity to hold up anything you want in prayer. And now, sisters and brothers, live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, speak truthfully, pray daily, all great things. Here's the key to the entire relationship with God. Leave everything, everything to the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.